Hello and welcome to the Delphian podcast. Delphian is an artist-led nomadic gallery focusing on emerging and early career artists. Each episode will feature a different art world practitioner, from artists and gallerists to collectors and curators. If you liked today's episode, please like, share and subscribe. Hello and welcome to the Delphian podcast. I am Benjamin Murphy and despite my best efforts, with me is Nick Jess Thompson. All right. Hello. <laughs> so joining us today is artist, photographer, curator and publisher Matt Martin. Matt is the events manager of the newly opened Photobook Cafe in Shoreditch as well as being the creator of the Photocopy Club and was the curator at the legendary Doom Gallery. Legendary. Yeah. yeah. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you for coming. No worries. So for the listeners who may not know about you, um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do, etc.? Yeah, um, so um, I've been doing photography for about the last 15, 14 years. Um, I started off just sort of taking pictures of my mates and doing little DIY exhibitions down in... I'm from Devon originally, Exeter. Um so I just kind of got into curation and that whole DIY side of things just through just just finding disused spaces, disused shops and stuff like that and just putting on little shows. And then um, photography sort of took me to Brighton and did some work for some photographers and then sort of the gallery stuff just sort of progressing and uh, just doing more and more curational work and, and stuff like that. And then Photocopy Club started and then went on to Doomed and... Um, just sort of mixing that whole uh, thing between trying to be a working photographer and then really enjoying working with other photographers and sort of working with their work and I just try and balance that now um, especially with the new role at Photobook Cafe it's just sort of supporting a lot of photographers and trying to get their work out but then also trying to do my own practice mm. as a, like a personal kind of thing I try and I don't really work in a commercial sense mm. as a photographer do you think that it's easier these days to collaborate with other artists as going back sort of 10 15 years with with the rise of social media yeah I mean the whole thing has been about collaboration like um I guess back then it was stuff like tumblr and things like that and weird there was a like Flickr. I guess was yeah. probably the main thing um and community was just that hot part of the whole thing like I haven't if it wasn't for all what's interesting about that whole scene is everyone's grown up together and pretty much everyone has stayed within photography um and made zines together and put on shows together and you know now we go to each other's like you know weddings and stuff it's like the whole the whole scene really grew um so yeah my whole practice wouldn't you know be what it is without collaboration definitely what effect has the curation of others' works had on your own practice? And would you advise to other artists that um, having some experience of curation, um, does that kind of benefit your own practice, I suppose? Um, yeah, I mean, I think like a huge person that I really looked up to was uh, Tim Barber, who did Tiny Vices. Um, and I really liked that whole idea of of setting up no, he he set up Tiny Vices, and that was a whole submission based thing. So that was the first time I kind of saw photographers, a photographer working in a way where he had, had other photographers submit, and then they had a you know a forum where the, that all could sit. And I think that was really important. Um, and you know, I love going to shows, and I think especially with with Doomed and the amount of different artists we had come in with different practices, I think that definitely affected you know, the way the way that I work and the way that I like working with people. Do you think it's um it's affected how you organise your own work and say how you view the curation of your own shows, etc.? Having, um, having a view of the other side of the curtain almost. I don't know, because my stuff has always been quite in, instant. Like with Photocopy Club, I don't take a lot of time. Like th- from all the submissions, I never it's not a big process of sitting there being like, oh God, does this work with this? And does that work with that? It's really instant. And I think that whole, you know, especially growing up as that kind of first generation who had that kind of online process of, of just, you know, constantly seeing image after image after image, you kind of built this kind of quickness of the stuff that you really, what you like and what you enjoy. And that was an, an instantness to putting it up on the wall. Um, and I don't know if there's other 
through the practice of other people have I mean maybe they have subconsciously in, influenced that but it's always been pretty just just free and fun and just trying to just not think about it too heavily and not go too deep I think with the photography not to try and annotate you know over annotate it too much just really on that personal connection of what you think is a nice what is an interesting image and what makes you feel something I guess does that answer that? <laughs> yeah. So um, you've got a new book coming out soon. Yeah. Uh, launching next month. So that's um, super cool. And it's the second sort of instalment almost of the American serography. Um, so it's, is it? A, would you see it as a series, or is it? A, would you see it as a standalone piece? I'm not sure. It's something that I've kind of grappled with a lot over the last year. So American serography, the first one was basically all about documenting uh, the west coast of america as if americans had just kind of upped and left and the idea i've been i was looking at a lot of um <clears throat> old imagery around uh you know uh, you know early 1900s imagery of like building railroads and i guess 1800 but building railroads national parks the infrastructure of the west coast of america building roads into into the landscape and the the way la had kind of sprawled out um from being a very small, a small area, and then you know, obviously Hollywood and stuff. So I kind of, I was looking at all this old imagery, and I kind of wanted to make a book that felt timeless in a way, but still was looking at a very modern side of America. And so the idea was to then shoot the work, come home, print it out on a black and white Xerox, and then just really play on the on the on the photocopier and use that like I was in the dark room. So just sort of brightness and contrast and recopying and rescanning. And then when I finally got to the the point of the image that I liked, I would then, you know, rescan that in and that was the premise of that book. Um and that was very handmade. It was, you know, we just did I just made a hundred copies, um, bound it myself. Um and this book covers 30 states of America and this was always just a you know a boyhood dream you know how did that take to photograph 30 states I did it in two months wow yeah so I it was long and heavy it's like a new state every two days or something yeah (laughs) (laughs) it was pretty crazy um and did you drive it all yeah wow and the idea with was this was to, yeah to kind of do that on a grander scale, but I've been obviously looking at you know the classics of of large American landscape work, and I I wanted to move into doing a color practice, but I still wanted to keep that the photocopying side within my because that's you know that's a lot of what I do, um, and so to then print this on a on a color photocopier and, and work in that same way but to still make landscape and <clears throat> um, work documented in America and, and have it just as as big as I could possibly kind of print mm-hmm. um, because I wanted people to feel really immersed in the, lands, in the landscape because that's, I think that's, you know, when you do travel across America, that's the one thing that really stands out to me is that you can, you know, wherever you are, especially, you know, out of major cities, is that you're just so alive. It's just, you can pull up in a small town and no one else is on the street. Everyone's driving cars. And so you sort of, there is a, you know, this mass and aloneness and kind of thing. But again, I didn't want it to be, you know, white middle-class guy drives across America and, and have that kind of thing to it. So the, so the, even though it is two months and 30 States and it, you know, it is a road trip. I, I kind of wanted the images to all stand alone. I didn't want it to feel like when you're looking through the book that it is, journey a journey i wanted because i go through all seasons in the book you know it starts in california it's september to october so by the time i'm in like new england on the east coast it's you know autumn and all the leaves are changing and then i'm going through the dakotas and that's all you know it's snowing and then i'm kind of going back into washington state and it's kind of feels kind of spring time in a way even though it's you know Mm. autumn but um <clears throat> having that whole mix of seasons as you as you cross America kind of makes the imagery you know not pit, you know not sit in that particular timescape of just two months on the road mm. um and the idea with doing it tabloid size 
and 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 not bound is that I wanted people to really sit and and look through the book. I didn't want anyone just to hold it in their hand, you know. Yeah, just you can't read it on the train. Yeah. Um, compared to the zine, you know, zines and stuff that are done, that you're quite disposable in a way. And this, I really wanted it to be a you know a project that people have to sit down and get immersed in. And even though the images aren't, you know, it's not. I didn't shoot on you know ten eight or you know it is still thirty five mil, but there is. You can sit and see a lot within the imagery. There's little things that you notice. Mm. I think that scanning the scanning the prints from a Xerox machine and then reprinting them, I think, like, is lovely. Like it's a really nice sort of addition, and you can see that coming through. Yeah, well, I've been looking at a lot of old of National Geographic's from the seventies and kind of trying to think and trying to sort of replicate that kind of dye transfer kind of feel. But also, I guess when you look at those old magazines, you really see the 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 dot pigment in the in the printing and so m going back to the american geography stuff I, I still i wanted this the color work to still have that feel of of something timeless or something maybe found or something you know the images could have been pulled out of the pages of a of a history book in a way yeah um and not to shoot anything <clears throat> too modern i mean it's very you know the the book is landscapes cars architecture it's very you know it's it's quite traditional in that sense but I, st I think it's still it holds a a mixture of modern and old i guess yeah i hope yeah so you obviously have an affinity or feel an affinity to the states what what draws you there why why have you been there so many times what is what attracts you to it um well as a kid i was really into kelvin and hobbs um, I had a primary school teacher who gave me all the books when I was like 10 or, and Calvin and Hobbes is, you know, it's about a, a small kid and his imaginary tiger and they live in, I, I guess it's probably like, uh, like New England kind of area. It's very like picket fence and, you know, there's white wooden houses with gardens that go on forever into woods and stuff like that. And I think, I think I went to New England when I was like 12 on just a family holiday and it's, you know, it's like lakes and you can run off a jetty and jump into the water and I think I'd always had loved that side of America I mean it's very you know it's very just traditional um and then when I was 21 I went to I was out in New, I went to I went to the states for three months I'd only kind of ever been to New York I went to Baltimore and that's when everything sort of winded up you know widened in in terms of you know how how big and how big the country is but you know it all brings in from film and other photography and stuff like that it's just sort of embedded but i think after this i probably i probably won't go back for a little bit i want to see some other places and try and do what i did with this project but in mm. looking at other landscapes where do you think's next i'm off to vietnam okay in april and you know i think even after Working as a photographer for for ten years, I think I've finally found my footing in terms of what I want to photograph, um, and the process and the way I want it displayed with with this book. Um, I th think because I always thought I'd be into you know I when moving to London I always thought I'd get into you know shoot fashion or portrait or whatever and I just really didn't enjoy it and I I really like shooting landscape work. Um, and just trying to put a slight twist on it rather than just sort of traditional mm. landscape kind of thing. It's probably a lot harder to make a living as a photographer not shooting like portraits or fashion or... Yeah, and that's where the curation and gallery side came into it. So that became, you know, that's my bread and butter and that's yeah. what... And I'm fortunate that I've had that, you know, lucky enough that I've had mentors or people that I've worked with that have given me great situations to build on that curational side and... Um, you know, teaching and doing workshops and stuff like that, um, which now means that photography doesn't need to, I don't need to make money off it. It's just, it can become an art practice to an, ex, you know, mm -hmm. to an extent, um, which is great. And it gives you a lot more, it just gives you a lot more freedom to, to make stuff. Mm -hmm. So like um, Delphine Gallery, Photocopy Club is a self-initiated artist-led project. So I was wondering if you could tell uh, us and I suppose the listeners a little bit about um, where these kind of self-initiated projects have taken you in your career that maybe you wouldn't have gone to or things you wouldn't have experienced if you weren't doing these kind of things. Oh, every you know, 
Photocopy Club was a really weird one because it was the idea of Photocopy Club was basically just to make an open submission project that was affordable to everyone. And so by letting photographers print their work as cheaply as possible using black and white photocopies, it meant that they could then submit to the show, which was a one-night show. They just sign and date their name on the back of the print. And then we do the exhibition and then all the people can, who come to the show can buy the work for £5. Oh, nice. So the idea was to make it affordable for photographers, but then affordable for people to buy photography because, you know, it's expensive. And also there's a lot of submission-based, ex, you know, projects that you have to pay or you have to get your work, you know, printed and framed and whatever. So it was trying to remove all of that um, and just have a really level playing field where photographers all printed in the same way um, and then people could buy their work. And it just, you know, it started in 2011 and the idea was just to do six exhibitions between Brighton and London. Um, and it just, like, flew. Like, it was, the I think, for the first show, we maybe had about 200 photographers submit. Um, and it just built and built and built. And then it was getting good write-ups and stuff. And then um, I got asked to go. I did some stuff for the Brighton Biannual, which we did, like... Um, we did like uh, four different exhibitions over the course of a month. So we did a different exhibition, curated a different show every week um, in the biannual. And then I went out, I did stuff for the, uh, sorry, that was for the Fringe. And then for the biannual, we did a thing which was uh, with, with Photo Works, which was a joint thing between Joburg, um, Johannesburg, where they had a, the first photography exhibition there. So we did like a, a culture exchange where photographers from there came here and me oh, and some photographers went out to Johannesburg been to Hong Kong and done some stuff with a gallery out there, which was in the middle of a shopping centre in Hong Kong, which was crazy. Um, and that was a really the first time I kind of saw the legs of it kind of... I had to... Basically, it was the middle of the shopping centre. They built this, this set in the middle, and I turned up, and I had a Britney mic, and I had to, like, do a <laughs> talk about the photocopy club. I had to translate her, and um, they shipped in all these school kids and there's all pictures of me like with all these school kids just like making photocopies and stuff and it was in, you know written up in the paper and all that kind of thing and then we've done stuff in Berlin and SF and Poland and um, I think what draws festivals or other photography curators to the project is it's just it's simple and it's easy and it's just a way that lots of people can be involved for not a huge amount of money. Mm. Um, is there a selection process or is it like totally... Yeah, so originally the first six shows were curated to to an extent, uh, but as the work just started to get better and better, it's, you know, if normally I'd say in the submission rules you'd submit between one and five images and the majority of people, one of those images would definitely, you know, be in the show. And then we started doing themed ones. So we did, you know, uh, one on <laughs> protest photography, skateboarding... Uh, the one in Hong Kong was to the theme Adventure and the Ocean. Um, um, we did one all about London. We've done one about San Francisco. Um, but the work, yeah, it's like it, everything's... The work's amazing. Everyone, the stuff that people submit is really on point. And it's rare that there's not anything that we, yeah, wouldn't put, put in the show, mm. which is great. And you've got a new series, the poster series that's coming out. The first one's out, right? Yeah. So what's what's the deal with that? That's a monthly publication. It it, <laughs> it was meant to be. Okay. Um, yeah. So, you know, it, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time and effort to put on submission based shows, and you know, it's all self funded. Yeah, it's just me. Like yeah. photocopy club is just me. Um, and. You know, we got, have all these submissions and, you know, have to do all the press and hire the space and stuff like that. And I was trying to think about a way that, because obviously a photocopy club, I don't want to do too many of them because I want people to get bored of it. So maybe doing like two a year kind of thing. And so the posters was an idea of keeping that submission process open, but people don't have to, they still have to go and make a photocopy, but then they scan it in and they just email it to me. And then I choose from that selection. And so the idea was to do an A2 poster that's double-sided set a theme and you get 15 photographers in each poster series um and i just like something because you know it's i found a place that wasn't too expensive to print and it could keep photocopy club you know in the 
in the public idea and people can keep submitting to it. Um, and I had really good feedback and we had probably over a hundred submissions, um, for that, um, made the poster and then it just didn't, re- no one really bought it. Okay. <laughs> and I think it's good to chat about this kind of thing because I think a lot of people get a bit, um, you know, especially with w- the way we look at how people's work is online and we think they're doing you know really well and stuff like that and you know a lot of people are but I think a lot of the time people don't realize that you can submit to stuff and this thing can be made but if you don't then you know support by buying the thing I can't make the next one kind of thing and I think that's people forget a lot with people people that make art is you can you know you can like it and say oh how great job mate but if you don't buy the thing then the person can't keep you know Mm -hmm. doing it um, so I'd like to keep it going for sure. Um, but yeah, I just need to figure out, and I don't know, maybe that was, you know, maybe people just didn't actually like it and maybe that's why they didn't buy it. So it's trying to figure out, obviously this is the first one and it's trying to select themes and I tried to put photographers in it that aren't household, you know, you know, I don't want to put yeah. household names. Like in this one, it's like, you know, we've got students from unis and people from the, you know, Philippines who are, you know, just people from all over the world that, you know, maybe photography is just a hobby. It's not, you know, their profession. So I tried to include people from everywhere. And it's all based on the image. It's not based on who who that person is. Um, So we'll see. I think I just have to, I'd like to keep it going for a bit, but obviously you need money to keep this (laughs) kind of going. So with Doomed Gallery, how did that all come about? So you ran it with uh, Ken. Ken Flaherty. Yeah. So I was I was still living in Brighton. Um, I was running a gallery called Create and working for a photographer down there. Was it Create with an eight? Uh, no. Oh, that's no, unusual. Yeah, C R E A T E, Create Studios. Um, I think there is a Create with an eight in Brighton think, as well. I think there's hundreds of the hundreds of there. <laughs> And um, I did. Uh, my friend Joe Skilton. Um, I was looking for a gallery in London to do a photocopy club, and he said, "Oh, I found this place called Doomed on Midley Road, and it's just this little, you know, doorway that had Doomed written above it. Above it, and I'm going to do a show there. And I was like, oh, cool! I'll come up and see the show. Maybe I could do a photocopy club there. Went up, met Ken. So this is like 2014. Um, me and Ken got on super well." Asked about doing a photocopy club. We did the first Xerox and Destroy one there. The skateboarding one. Um, went really well. Got loads of, you know, loads of people came down. Um, it was a really good show. And then Ken basically just put up on Facebook that he was looking for someone to take. Because basically Doomed was a gallery, but also had two bedrooms in it. And it was in a basement, Ridley Road. Um, underground, dark, DIY, perfect. Um <laughs> And so I messaged Ken when he put up the thing, and I was like, "Hey, if I move up to London, um, can I help you with the with the space?" And so did you move in? Yeah. So I, me and Ken lived in Doomed. He had already been in that space for about ten years at that point. It was originally his studio, and then he converted it into a gallery. Um, and so, yeah, I moved in, and I I was there for like, I lived there for two years, and then was out of there for three. But we still kept, you know, mm. we worked together that whole time. And yeah, I think that Doomed had maybe only done a handful of shows before before I started, and it hadn't, you know, it was starting to, you know, gain momentum. And then Ken's side of things, and knowing everyone in London, and then my side of that sort of from the youth culture zini vibe. And then you know, we're both, you know, my background is punk, and Ken's a nineteen seventy seven punk. So it's just that we just combined that on the DIY ethos, and it just. Uh, worked really well as a space that we just wanted to make. It was the same with Photocopy Club. We wanted to make it affordable and easy for people to have shows. We did a show there. We did. Long before there was Delphian. Yeah. Yeah. It was a a Nick J.S. Thompson solo show. We built an Anderson shelter in the gallery. (laughs) We had the roof of that in the the garden. As your roof. (laughs) Yeah, I think Ken actually used it for something else. (laughs) I didn't remember. I didn't realise that we'd left that Mm. (laughs) there. Black corrugated. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's when was that? Two thousand. That's probably two thousand and fourteen as well, right? Yeah, maybe end two thousand and fourteen, maybe. Yeah, yeah time, time just all blends into, blends into one. <laughs> yeah, 
So is there any plans to sort of reinvent that and revive it in any form in the future? I mean, we just burnt, we just burnt out. We were doing a lot of shows, you know, sometimes, you know, two exhibitions a week. Um, and we closed it pretty quick. And I think we kind of had the idea that we wanted it to be like the, you know, when the Sex Pistols broke up, it's just, you know, end it on a, on a high, Mm. um, and not let it just sort of burn, you know, burn out or us not care as much anymore or something like that. You know, it's just hard with, you know, money and rent and... Did it feel like a breakup? It didn't feel like a breakup. It just, it felt like a good, just felt like a good ending. Like I didn't really know what more we could do with the space and it'd be great to do like a do a, a doom two at some point but i think it's kind of like a ledger gallery in new york you know mm. it was like it was a time and a place when all these a certain thing of artists all came together and it was kind of the end of that era of dalston you know with the alibi closing and um other venues and dalston sort of changing um everything kind of ended all at the same kind of time weirdly but that was the same in Brighton, like everything weirdly ended at the Just same the time. Just the death of Dalston. Yeah, death of Dalston. <laughs> but um, I'd, I'd like to open a new space, but I mean, with Photobook Caf, um, it's basically everything I wanted in a space anyway. Like if I had the money, I would have started Photobook Caf. Mm-hmm. And I'm just lucky that uh, that Lee from Rapid Eye, who's like my, now my new Ken <laughs> in <all> the <laughs> way. <laughs> But it's yeah, it's interesting. I I I have the I've had these like four major mentors or people in my life that I work really well with, and weirdly they've all been quite a lot older than me. So at college, I had the photography technician Jeff was like he was really into graffiti, and so he got me into graffiti and taking pictures, and he was older. And then when I moved to Brighton, I had this guy Kevin who I became his assistant for, and then London was Ken, and now Lee, and it's kind of there's these like weird chapters of every five years or so. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, for the minute, photo book calf is probably the main thing. But I think DIY venues are really important, and 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 having the having spaces um, that are affordable for for artists to show their work um, does need to keep happening in London. Mm. Seems like a lot of what you do has this kind of spirit of punk, like DIY ethos. Do you think it's important for artists to have that approach and to kind of learn by doing and wing it sometimes maybe get things wrong? Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. I think the only, no one's going to do it for you. It's like yeah, it, DIY is the whole embodiment, I think, of, I mean, it's, you know, it's what you guys are doing as well. It's like it's just no one's, you know, we're just going to, you don't, you know, not having a physical space, but just keep keep it moving and keep that and stuff st- keep stuff going and supporting artists and I think as long as you have that collaboration between DIY gallerists and curators at, at supporting DIY artists then uh, then everything should just should just work and really it's not I think that's when the best stuff happens when you're not too worried about making money or you know huge success or whatever you just do it for the for the fun of it and I mean that's what punk was all about if, you know you remove the music and you remove the the fashion and just think of punk as the as a word that is that i think that's the premise of everything in terms of just getting on and doing it and just doing stuff for the fun of it and not really caring what what the industry mm. thinks often the money kind of takes the fun out of it anyway right yeah um i mean obviously <laughs> you know you need the money to make the work but i think you you know you just have to live within your means don't you and just make stuff with what you have. So if you had unlimited time, space, money, what would your like dream project be? What would you love to do? Unlimited <laughs> time. If you had eight arms, <laughs> what would you do with them? <laughs> oh, the possibilities. Um, oh man, I don't know. Uh, I think I was having a conversation with, with someone the other with some people the other day and they were saying oh what age in life would you kind of go back to and I was like I'm 32 now and I was like I'm kind of quite 
happy. The only thing I have to worry about is money at this time. Um, and even that's not like a huge, like you just get, you get by on what, you know, whatever you can make. And I, I don't know if I had unlimited resources, I think I'd probably just still be, still do the same thing, but maybe travel more, do stuff in different countries. I think what I would like to try and do this year and what I'm trying to do more of it is do stuff out of London. Yeah. Um, because we get stuck in such a bubble here and, um, you know, it's, it, it, you know, it's great supporting London artists, but you know, there's amazing people in Leeds and Manchester and Liverpool and, and Newcastle and Edinburgh and Glasgow doing amazing stuff. And sometimes I feel they maybe don't get as much recognition as they should. So I think I would probably just, you know, try make get the train to Glasgow. <laughs> yeah, if you had unlimited time, space, and money, or just pop make up to Glasgow. Make d- more dooms. Make more doom galleries all over the country and in you know throughout Europe. Um, and just you know build. Yeah, keep DIY spaces available for everyone in every community. It's <laughs> a pretty demic. It's a pretty yeah. Go and live on a yacht and in an island and <laughs> s- never do, do anything never again. again. <laughs> All right. Great. Well, question we ask everyone, so we're going to ask you it. What advice would you give to an early career artist or photographer starting their artistic career? Um, the advice I would give is to just... Man, I think... I think what I, when I first started making zines and wanting my photography to get out into the world, I, I, I sent zines and, and prints and stuff to photographers that I liked or to, you know, people that I admired. And I think when I go and teach at unis and stuff and I talk to the students and they're, you know, maybe they send out their, you know, send an email out with their portfolio or whatever. And I, I just, I, my biggest advice is to just make stuff and, and, and send it to the, the people that you like I think what we kind of you know a lot of people get it just gets missed if you email someone and say hey this is my work everyone's so busy but I think if you you hand make stuff and send that to people um I found that that was the best way for me when I started to get my work and you know some of those people who I really looked up to and are really close friends because of that um so and also just don't worry about... I think there's such a, a thing within the art industry of finding the next big thing when someone's, you know, 16 and straight out of whatever and people start to think, oh, God, I've not made it by the age of 20. And it's like, you're not going to make your best work until you're over 30 or even over 40, really, um, or find exactly what you want. So I think just the best advice is just to, like, not rush it and it'll just uh, it'll work out in the end there's a great quote and I can't really remember it but it's something (laughs) along the lines I'm always doing that something along the lines of like you're a you're a promising artist in your 30s and you're a good artist in your 40s and you're a great artist in your 50s 50s, and when you're dead you're the best (laughs) (laughs) right Let's end it on that note. <laughs> You're best when you're dead. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Cool. No worries. Thanks, guys. Goodbye.